I want to welcome members of the Duke community uh, to a discussion about the history of structural racism in the United States. I'm Edward Ballison, Professor of History and Public Policy here at Duke and Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies. And I'm joined today by... I'm Tavali Agrim, um, Professor of History and Law. Favolia, thanks so much for joining me for this discussion. Uh, Ed, um, it's a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. Uh, so this is going to be the first of two segments. Uh, the fir first of our uh, uh, discussions is going to look at uh, the really broad history of structural racism in the United States. And then we're going to dig in in a second segment to the implications of that history for Duke University. Um, beginning with its founding in 1838. I want to stress at the outset that this, these conversations are really just going to be entry points to a very uh, uh, broad uh, and rich uh, set of discussions that you can find about these topics. Uh, and we're going to be offering you some examples of where you might go next if you'd like to dig in more deeply to these important, uh, important issues. Favolia, I, I wonder if we could start by your reflecting on three or four really crucial aspects of American history uh, that too many people just don't really know much about. Okay, thank, uh, thank you very much, Ed. Um, so I, as Ed said, you know, we, we'd like for this conversation to be a conversation and um, in the over the many decades now that I've been teaching um, U.S. history and speaking about U.S. history um, in various settings, um, I am constantly amazed um, by how much we don't, as Americans, know about U.S. history, about our history, and it seems to me that the 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 most critical things that we don't know have to do with race, which seems very odd since race is so central to how we live, our conversations, um, how we work, who we live with. And so that seems to me, it's always seemed to me very, very odd. Um, and so part of my mission has been to help center or recenter the conversation um, and, and help increase what we know, what Americans know about our history. And I keep saying our history because I want to emphasize that the history of African Americans is American history. It's US history. And we know very little about, for example, slavery. And that seems really crazy uh, because Slavery comes up all the time, whether we're talking about um, reparations or whether we're talking about the legacies of slavery. But what Americans seem to know about slavery is very limited to images of plantations, of people picking cotton on plantations, and they seem to know very little about what it meant to be enslaved. Um, and so I think that's really important. I think it's really important also that we spend more time talking about how transformative the notion of ending human bondage was, um, how this idea that human beings should not be commodified, that human beings should not be for a sale, um, how that notion took hold and what role it played in the um, uh, history of this country and ultimately the emancipation of four million people who had been enslaved or were enslaved in 1816. Um, so the juxtaposition of um, the notion that human beings have an absolute right to property and the idea that that property could include people. So that's a really a, a really big problem in our history um, that I think yeah, we, we should know more about. Um, I think in that regard, when we talk about slavery and the end of slavery, 
um, sort of thinking about this idea that we could, Americans thought, at least some Americans, um, Republicans in the North in the 1850s, for example, thought that they could cordon off this problem of race, right? build a wall around race. Um, and if they could build a wall around race, they could build a wall around plantations and slavery and just have it um, um, sort of limited to the American South. And that was the idea behind um, the various compromises, like the Compromise of 1850. Um, but that didn't work, and Civil War came. And so that's the third subject that we um, know too little about. Um, we know about battles. We know about Gettysburg and Antietam. Um, we know about the Battle of Atlanta. We know about Sherman marching through the South, but we don't know enough about ordinary people's lives during the war, and especially about Black lives during the war. Um, how many Americans know that 200,000 African American men took up arms? They've seen Glory, maybe. Some of them have seen the movie Glory, but it still doesn't give you a sense of the magnitude of the rebellion against slavery that encompassed black men who took up arms against men who had claimed them or claimed to own them. It doesn't encompass the magnitude of black women who took up arms or who ran away um, trying to find a place of safety um, behind union lines. And so I think um, the Civil War uh, is, something that we need to know more about. And the last thing, well, not the last thing, but the next, and I'll stop there, we can uh, go into more detail, uh, would be reconstruction. Um, so the war ends, the civil war ends, and this country has to decide how it will incorporate 4 million plus African Americans, some of whom um, were emancipated during the war. And so this really radical program takes place where Congress, led by the radical Republicans, passed a series of laws that allowed um, Black people to become citizens, the 13th Amendment, I mean, the, to become free um, constitutionally, because people thought. Um, that the Emancipation Proclamation would not, it was a wartime measure, it was a military measure, would not uh, pass muster after the war constitutionally. So the 13th Amendment um, gave freedom uh, to the former slaves and the 14th Amendment um, citizenship and the 15th Amendment gave uh, black men the right to vote. And so you have these additions to the Constitution that not only benefit African Americans, but benefit all Americans and benefit people who are yet to come, right? Um, who can come and have children raise a family here um, as uh, immigrants and their children, if they're born here, are birthright citizens. Although that's been under attack in recent years, um, it still stands that if you're born in this country, you are a citizen. And that's a product of the Civil War and emancipation. Just as so many of the most liberal, um, uh, laws and ideas that we take for granted and that we assume had their origins in the um, constitutional convention have their origins in the uh, Reconstruction era. Uh, one of the um, most important things that we should remember about Reconstruction is that for the first time, African American men get to vote, right? And I was just working on another project and, and, and going through a list of people uh, who voted in 1868. And among them was a man who was 96 years old and who voted for the first time in 1868. Um, and so can you imagine what that must have meant? He had been a slave for most of his life, all of his life. And so these men vote and they, they come up with the most progressive state constitutions that this country had ever seen. State constitutions that make public education a right, 
um, that give women the right not only to divorce, but to hold property in their name. And we tend to think of that as a 20th century um, development, but it was a 19th century development um, that took place in these radical uh, state constitutional conventions that were then placed in, in the constitutions. And those constitutional conventions uh, were uh, often, at least the most radical provisions were often proposed by black men, right? Men who had been slaves um, and who now sat in the state house in every southern state um, in, this, in, in the country. So those are some of the things that I think um, are really important uh, to know and um, the last thing, and we and I don't, we can talk about this later. Would be, you know, like how we think about race itself and what it is and what it's not, right? So you you mentioned Thavolia, the remarkable uh, progressive thrust of political change in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, uh, with these uh, quite progressive Southern constitutions that emerged. And yet within just a handful of years, there was a, a incredibly strong political reaction against those developments. And we, we've seen that in the 150 su succeeding years, a uh, series of, of moments where uh, African-Americans and, and other allies have pushed forward for a greater sense of, of, so, of social and racial justice, making progress here or there only to then be met by forces of political reaction. I, I wonder if you might sketch out what some of that has looked like. Uh, certainly. It, it has seemed um, uh, too often that uh, in this country, African-Americans um, make some progress and then there's a reaction, as you point out, and we're back, not really back where we started, but we're, we have to go back and, 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 and make the same arguments. And, and the, 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 the one argument that African-Americans have, have had to keep making um, was that we are human beings. <laughs> we, um, and citizens of this country after 1868. Um, and one would think, um, on the one hand, there's this remarkable constitution that comes out of the fight with England and independence. Um, and that remarkable constitution has at the same time elements that are not progressive, right? Um, such as the three-fifths clause. Um, but there's enough there to give all kinds of people who come from different places in the world um, this idea that they can be anything here, they can make it here. And that included black people right um and so we have to account for um the development of a, a community of free black people before the civil war that's really important but at the same time that this community is developing and growing they increasingly by the mid 19th century face repression you know in, in places like ohio that say well no um you have to leave. And so you see people who have left South Carolina and Mississippi for Ohio now trying to find their way to Canada, mm -hmm. right? So that's one kind of reaction. Uh, you know, on the one hand, we have a, a, a situation or, or where you can, if you are a black person, you can take your case to court. You can go to court and say, because I lived in a free state and I've been move back to a slave state. I can claim my freedom as Dred Scott did. And so many people went to court and sued for their freedom. And, and so many people got their freedom this way. Of course, Dred Scott did not. 
So that's another kind of reaction. Then the Civil War comes and freedom comes and you have these amazing amendments, but none of that has convinced the white South that black people are equal, mm. um, that they uh, should have the same rights. And so Southerners who fought for slavery, who were traitors to this country, were never reconstructed, right? And so the, the very first chance they got to turn the tables, they did. And so if you have a lot of violence um, to keep black people from voting. Um, and then you have trend, the South sort of transitions to a place where they can, they decide that they can really take the right to vote away and nothing will happen to them. That Northern white people will not rise up as abolitionists had done um, if they take the right to vote away from black men. And so they do that. And so what's also interesting is that the white South benefits once again um, through the, um, with the electoral college, right? Because before the war, Southern states could count black people to help determine how many electoral college votes they would get. When blacks are disfranchised beginning in 1890, they can still count them, but black people have no rights. And in 1883, the Supreme Court declares the Civil Rights Act of 1875 to be unconstitutional. This is a huge setback for African Americans in their fight for equality. And we move into this, the 20th century, um, Black people are sort of hemmed in by um, uh, Jim Crow laws. They are hemmed in by other forms of like, like informal uh, uh, means of disrespect. Uh, so on the one hand, students can look at, you can show them images of uh, signs that say colored and white for restrooms or bus stations. You can't show them someone being pushed off the sidewalk or someone being called um, the n-word you can't show them the everyday disrespect that black people suffered uh, so what's also important then to to share with our students is that despite the setbacks uh, black people didn't give up right they continued to fight uh, to fight for the desegregation of, of schools, to fight for better schools for themselves, and slowly, gradually, um, to fight um, to have voting rights restored. Uh, so over the course of the 20th century, um, those battles take place, led by the NAACP um, in the early years, um, in the courts, to get black students in graduate professional schools um, at white colleges and universities to get the white primary um, outlawed um, so that black people vote, can vote and their votes will count. So those are some of the things that I think um, that sort of are, um, tell us something about how difficult um, it's been to make steady upward progress because um, at too many moments there's a pushback um, and even after the civil rights and voting rights acts in the 1960s that that similarly pr produced a very significant white backlash in significant parts of the country exactly um, and you know from boston to uh, jackson mississippi uh, the white backlash took place so ultimately, I think the question that we are still contending with um, pretty unsuccessfully is why? Mm. Why have white people um, 
been so determined. And I, I, you know, not all white people, but, you know, in general, have been so determined to prevent people of African descent from enjoying their full rights as citizens, as free people um, in this country. And that's a difficult question. Um, and the answer, um, I, I don't know. It's um, what the answer to that is. I mean, we, um, there's a lot of speculation about why, but none of it makes much sense, right? <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense that there's this notion that, um, and there was a recent article um, uh, on this, that only black people suffer from um, an economy that um, is geared more to supporting the very rich, right? Um, and so there's a, and I hesitate to use the word, but there's a discourse that suggests that black people are the only ones that suffer, so we cannot worry about them because white people don't suffer. But poor white people suffer uh, from poor schools and, 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 and a lack of jobs and, and um, drug abuse. So the race question is, um, very, very difficult. And I, I suspect, although I don't uh, plan to offer any kind of answer, um, I suspect that it has a lot to do with the way in which we have defined race in this country. Um, and as it, if it's biological, um, as if there is something that makes a person with one kind of skin color better or different than another. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but we still enjoy that kind of analogy, that kind of thinking. And then by enjoy, I mean, we still, um, uh, well, some people enjoy it. Um, we still use it, um, even though we know that um, race is not biological. Mm -hmm. Many aspects of the history of American racism have been blatant and overt. Um, thinking of the abject cruelty of slavery described for all to read in newspaper advertisements for runaway slaves. Uh, the public lynchings and race riots that lasted into the 20th century that were such a powerful dimension of that, that response to Reconstruction. Um, depictions of black inferiority by whites in American religion, um, political speech in corporate marketing and in literature, film and, and television. But, but there have also been many more hidden institutions of discrimination, especially in politics and the economy. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could close out this segment, if you could just maybe reflect a, a little bit more on what some of those hidden dimensions of discrimination have, uh, have looked like. There's so many and um, because they are hidden, as you suggest, um, it's been very difficult for Americans to process um, what African Americans um, mean when they say um, this is not this country is not fair or the situation is not fair because what if if you think for example that if I make the same amount of money that you do, I mean, the hypothetical, mm -hmm. um, then it's all good, right? Um, I should be able to do what you do, but a black person in that situation can't necessarily do what a white person with the same degree, the same income can do. Um, because the, the hidden structure of racism means that that black person with an ample salary and even an Ivy League degree cannot necessarily go into the bank and get the same interest rate, right? Mm -hmm. Cannot necessarily move into the same neighborhood. And of course, it's not as horrible as it once was because redlining is no longer visible. Right? 
Um, and it wasn't visible when it was used. I mean, only to the people who were, you know, um, uh, the, the bankers and um, uh, white uh, homeowners who, you know, wanted to make sure they didn't move into a black neighborhood and black people didn't move into their neighborhood. It's such so, an interesting term, redlining, you know, because there are these red lines on maps that, um, that, that, that bankers had in the 1930s and 40s of urban America that were basically dis distinguishing the uh, the areas in town between, you know, those who that were largely uh, white, those that were largely black, those that had people from both racial categories living there. Right, and the ones that were red lined and within a certain red line that were, you know, for blacks, of course, if you wanted to buy there, you typically paid more for the house in terms of the value and for uh, and, and in terms of the interest rates. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and um, even if you could um, uh, somehow manage to convince a banker that you could buy a house and you might run up against a deed that said, no, you can't, right? Um, the deed would say no Negroes, except if the Negro is a domestic worker. Right, and, but that domestic worker can be in the neighborhood, can be in the home, but can but no Negro can buy a house or buy this particular house. Um, and I think today, when we think about the hidden uh, structures of racism and discrimination, um, we think about gentrification, which is a huge uh, problem all over the country. On the one hand, uh, uh, urban neighborhoods, uh, you know, are have a a better, larger tax base, but um, at what expense? You know, the people who are um, can no longer afford to live in the urban areas where they've lived all their lives for generations. Um, so those are some of the kinds of uh, racist practices, and I think um, you know, in thinking about to another issue that's very much uh, discussed today, you know in terms of monuments, I mean, another cost to black people is that for decades they were paying through their taxes for the upkeep of monuments. Um, where state governments and the federal government um, are subsidized mon Confederate monuments. And so it's never been quite fair, even when they were paying taxes in the early 20th century um, and they got no school buses, so they got poor schools, um, school buildings, and that sort of thing. Uh, so, it's the naming of high schools and even high school mascots and the the street names and the names of neighborhoods. It's there's this massive imprinting of Confederate culture, actually, massive. across the United States. Yeah, and I, and I think I sort of. Um, I think that one aspect of this is, uh, is largely missing in the conversation, which is that Confederate monuments are not simply there to intimidate African Americans. They're there to bring white people together. Mm. Um, and I think that function may be ultimately the most important function. I mean, I grew up in a, in a city um, where there were Confederate monuments everywhere, but luckily um, a very strong African-American community. So none of our schools were named for Confederate generals. Um, but the monuments were seen as something white people needed rather than something that would, should make us fear them. Um, but, you know, that's just a, another aspect of it. Um, well, Favolia, I, I want to thank you so much for this conversation and look forward to, to our, next, uh, uh, our next conversation, which is going to be about how this larger history has helped to shape the trajectory of Duke University. Thanks. Great.